The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the Whistler's strange story, The Judas Face. The movie star lay on the hospital bed, looking up at the white ceiling through narrow slits and the efficient mask of gauze and tape which covered her face. A million-dollar face, the trade papers had called it, with sparkling blue eyes, a delicate nose, and passionate full lips. Yes, in every sense of the word, the face of Sandra Dane was her fortune. Then, in ten seconds, everything had changed. There was an afternoon horseback ride with Janet Blaisdell, her stand-in, a gust of wind, Janet's silk scarf and the horse's eyes, a terrified plunge, a fall, flying hooves all around her in blackness. Then the hospital smell, quiet, efficient Dr. Rogers and his quiet, efficient staff, Janet and Gordon West, her producer, visiting her every afternoon, all of them kind and sympathetic. All of them knowing that the million-dollar face might be gone forever. That behind the mask of bandages was a question mark. Well, don't sit there staring at me, Gordon, darling. The end of the world hasn't come, you know. Oh, of course not, Sandy. I hope not. Janet, dear, it wasn't your fault. The wind blew your scarf and... That's what I keep telling her, Sandra. But you know how she is. If you must feel sorry for someone, dear, how about poor Gordy? He's got a million dollars tied up in the picture, and he can't shoot a lick until I get out of Hawk. Well, that, that's right, isn't it? Sandy, dear, we've been wanting to Please, tell you... Please, Janet. For... Well, what's going on? Sandy, about the picture... What about the picture? You... You know how bankers are. Bankers? This accident of yours... I know you'll be all right, but so far as they're concerned, well... Uh... What are you trying to tell me, Gordy? You've got to understand, Sandy. The bankers insisted that Gordy test someone else for the party. Of course, I... I thought of Janet first. Janet? You... You're playing my part? She didn't want to do it, Sandy. Neither did I, but there just wasn't anything else we could do about it. Janet, playing my part. <laughs> Please don't feel badly about it, Sandy. I feel badly. I think it's marvelous. It's so funny. My stand-in. It just doesn't happen. Oh, it's a wonderful break for you, dear. Wonderful. Well, what did I tell you, Janet? I knew she'd understand. And you don't have to worry, Sandy. No matter how this plastic surgery turns out, there'll always be a job for you at my studio. You know that. A job? But the operation's been successful. I'm sure of it. it... They told me there was no question. Of course. You've been wonderful, darling. Now we've got to run along it. At... Oh, hello, Dr. Rogers. Hello, everyone. And if I see the patient alone for a few minutes? You're just leaving, Doctor. Chin up, Sandy. Goodbye, dear, and good luck. We'll be seeing you. You certainly have nice friends. Yes, aren't they, Doctor? Do you mean that? Why not? I happen to know, Miss Dane, that you believe Janet Blaisdell was responsible for your accident. That in a fit of jealousy over your career, she purposely whipped a scarf into the eyes of your horse. <laughs> Well, how can you say a thing like that? I didn't say it first, Miss Dane. You did. What do you mean? While you were under the anesthetic. That happens frequently, you know. I'm bringing this up for good reason, Miss Dane. In the event this operation doesn't uh, come up to expectations, a thought like this playing on your mind can ruin your entire life. I hired you as a plastic surgeon, Dr. Rogers, and not as a psychiatrist. I'm sorry, Miss Dane. I simply felt that now, of all times, was the moment to bring it up. Why? 
I'm going to remove your bandages. When? Now. Steady now. You must remember that we've done the very best we could. Please hurry, Doctor. Just a second more. I can guarantee that the reconstruction will give you a normal appearance, but... But what? Whether or not you'll be able to resume your career, I, I don't know. Now, there you are. Um, a mirror. Give me a mirror. Very well. Here. I've tried to tell you, Miss... Get out of here! Get out! But Miss Jane... Get out! Very well. (laughs) Million dollar fate. That's so loud. She did it. It was a plot. She blinded the horse. I'm dead. I might as well be dead. But she's not going to get away with it. I'll kill her! With the prologue of The Judas Face, another strange tale by The Whistler. And now, back to The Whistler. Dollar face is a thing of the past, Sandra. And Janet Blaisdell, your pretty stand-in, is going to take your place in your picture. It was too much to take, wasn't it, Sandra? Janet in your place. Earnest, eager little Janet. The same girl who stood under the hot studio lights for endless minutes while cameras were focused and mic booms adjusted. The girl who took it for you while you sat in the cool shadows and watched. Yes, Sandra, it's more than you can swallow. But you're not raging anymore. There's only cool, calm hatred now and a plan to kill. So you go about it methodically. First, of course, there's the matter of the assistant producer's job Gordon West promised you. Oh, you've been so wonderful, Gordy. It's all set then about the job? Sure, Sandy. You're going to be my assistant on Janet's first picture. How's that? It's perfect. Just perfect. Step one, Sandra, the job. So you go to work for Gordon West. And in a week or so, you decide to tackle step two. It seems that Janet's picture is a western and will be shot on location. There are two possible sites. Hamilton Ranch or Felipe Mesa. And Gordon hasn't decided yet. Frank Reynolds, the chief cameraman, will have a lot to say about that. Gordon depends on him. I don't know, Sandy. Last time I talked to the boss, he was all for Hamilton Ranch. But there's no comparison, Frank. I, I was brought up near there. I know it's like a book. Please talk to him, Frank. I know he'll listen to you. Why? Why what? Why are you so interested? Because it'll make the difference between a first-class Western and a cheap yeah, you one. You want Janet's debut to be a topper, huh? Why, why, of course. Why not? I'm a cameraman, Sandy. I've been trained to catch human emotion on film. Look for people's thoughts and their eyes and their faces. Well? Uh, Nothing. Matter of fact, I was on my way to the boss to make a pitch for Philippa Mesa, too. I kind of wonder if you and I have the same reason. It has to be Philippa Mesa, doesn't it, Sandra? You weren't bragging. You know it like a book. It's steep sides, the narrow, dangerous trail winding up the cliff to the top that they'll be bound to use for the chase sequence, with Janet plunging down it at a full gallop, the wall falling away sheer on her right for 300 feet. Yes, Sandra, Philippa Mesa is perfect. It has everything you need. Two hours later, 
Frank comes out of Gordon's office. Frank. Yeah? What did he decide? You win, honey. Philippa Mesa. So you're over the first hurdle, Sandra. And for the next two weeks, as the company prepares to leave for location, you think it through again and again, coolly taking your time, anticipating, preparing, concentrating on the climax that will come when Janet reins her horse at the top of the mesa, pauses a moment, and then starts down the trail. Sandy! Uh, oh, Janet. <laughs> What's the matter, dear? Did I scare you? No. No, Janet, I was just thinking. I'm sorry. You look so funny smiling to yourself that way. I just dropped by to tell you we're leaving tomorrow. Start shooting Monday. Isn't it wonderful? Of course, dear. I'm so, so thrilled for you. And I'm so thankful to you, Sandy. All the help you've given me. You've been so good about everything. Why, don't be silly, darling. We've got to make good, you know. You and I. <laughs> Yes, Sandra, you've got to make good. And everything is pointing in the right direction. You relax now and wait, smiling to yourself over Janet's enthusiasm on the trip to location during the preliminary shooting, controlling the anger inside you as Gordon West raves over her performance. It's still going to be your picture, isn't it, Sandra? Then at last the moment arrives, the day when the chase sequence is to be shot from the ream of the mesa. The weather has been blistering hot for the past week, and the company is restless as Gordon gives them last-minute instructions. Quiet, please, quiet! (laughs) Now listen, everyone. I want to shoot this chase without a break in the action. Get it all in one unbroken sequence. Get that, Frank? Okay, Gordy. Cameras are all set. Now you men who are the heavies, remember when you're chasing Janet down that trail, don't crowd her. Look as though you're laying on the leather, but don't get too close. I don't want any accidents. Janet. Right here, Gordy. You're sure you've got the action all straight? Of course. I stop for a minute at the top and then take the trail down the south face. Come here a minute. Yes, Gordy? This is the last chance, honey. What about the double? No. Why? Well, Sandy would never have used the double. Neither will I. Well, she never did a trick like this. How do you know she wouldn't? I know her pretty well. Oh, please, let's not go through it again. Okay. By the way, where's Sandy? Oh, over there, sitting down. I'm afraid the heat's got her. Oh, all right, you'd better get up there. What's the matter, Sandy? Oh, I'm just a little dizzy, I guess. Afraid I'm not going to be much good to you today. You're pretty hot at that. Maybe you'd better go back to the camp, huh? <laughs> I was hoping you'd suggest that. Maybe I'd better send someone back there with you. Be alone, you know. Not a soul in the camp. Oh, forget it. I'll be all right. Just lie down for a while. Okay. Oh, and, uh, Gordy. Yeah? Wish Janet a lot of luck for me. Will you? Sure. All right, kids, let's go. They've gone now, Sandra. Gordon's on top of the mesa to direct the action by phone. The cameramen and actors are in their places, and you're supposed to be alone in camp with a sick headache. You know the mesa, don't you, Sandra? No one sees you as you slip along the chaparral-covered slope at the foot of the mesa, up through the underbrush to the spot you found the first day of shooting, right next to the trail, halfway to the top. A perfect spot, isn't it? A huge boulder on one side, greasewood and mesquite on the other. You crouch beside a strong steel stake you'd driven firmly into the earth the night before, Pick up the ends of a thin wire rope looped around the mesquite root on the other side of the trail, invisible under the dust you scattered over it. You're ready now, waiting, listening, and then... She's coming, Sandra. You tighten the rope. Hitch it firmly around the steel stake. You're ready for her now. So it was your picture after all, wasn't it, Sandra? The weeks of planning paid off. The moment the horse tripped, a flip of the cable loosened it from the mesquite root and it lost forever, along with a steel stake among the boulders at the bottom of the gorge. 
You're back in camp, lying down, of course, with your sick headache when Gordon arrives with the news. Dead. Dead. Oh, no, Gordy, no. Take it easy, Sandy. Oh, you're wrong, Gordy. She can't be dead. She's just a kid. Not Janet, no. <laughs> Yes, Sandra, that was an Academy Award performance. Even though you don't have the face to go to uh, go with it anymore, it's all settled now. There was no question, just a few formalities and an official statement by the coroner that Janet Blaisdell died as the result of an accidental fall from a horse. The weeks pass and you go back to your job at Gordon's side in Hollywood. Yes, it's settled. You did a perfect job. There's no evidence... And yet there's still a vague, uneasy feeling inside you, as if something was hanging over your head, ready to fall. Somehow you can't put your finger on it. At least until the day Frank Reynolds, the cameraman, takes you to lunch. You know, Sandy, I think I told you once about the peculiar insight a guy gets after grinding a camera for ten years. What do you mean, Frank? Well, it's funny. You can almost tell what a person's thinking. Just the way he holds his face. You know, I can spot hatred a mile away, for instance. Jealousy. The cold look of a... Of what, Frank? Of a murderer. (laughs) Funny, isn't it? It's interesting. They can't hide it, you know. It's there in spite of them. It's odd. I, uh... I thought I saw it in your face out on location that day. The day Janet died. Yes, uh, that is odd. It indicates that you're not infallible anyway. It's, uh... Not there now, though. Of course it isn't. Now, suppose... Just a minute, Sandy. It isn't there now. There's something else. What? Fear. I want you to come over to my house tonight, Sandy. No, I'm sorry, Frank. I won't take no for an answer, Sandy. Be there at eight. There's something I want you to see. You make an excuse. Tell them you're ill. Leave the office that afternoon. He's bluffing you, Sandra. You tell yourself again and again that Frank Reynolds is bluffing you. That there's no reason in the world for you to go to his house at eight tonight. And a thousand good reasons why you shouldn't. There's no proof. No evidence. Why should you fall for it? Of course not. So, at seven o'clock, you decide definitely you're not going. And at eight o'clock sharp, you're ringing his doorbell. Hello, Sandy. Hello, Frank. Well, are you coming in? I can only stay for a minute. I won't be long. I began to think you weren't coming. I came here for only one reason, Frank. To get to the bottom of that double talk at lunch today. That's exactly why we're going downstairs. I've got a movie projector there. You know... Rally the folks around for a private showing once in a while? Now, sit right down over there, Sandy. Screen's all set up. Please, Frank, let's stop this nonsense. I told you I can only stay a few minutes and... What's that revolver doing on your desk? Revolver? Oh, Oh, that. I was cleaning it before dinner. Nice thing to have around. No telling what dangerous characters a man might meet in my business. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, you're not a dangerous character, are you, Sandy? So I'll put it away for now. Let's look at the pictures, huh? I'm sure you're going to find them interesting, Sandra. You see, I took them myself the day of the chase sequence at Philippa Mesa. Oh, the chase sequence. That's right. The chase sequence. You remember that day, of course. The day Janet was mur... The day... Janet died. I'll turn out the lights here. Yeah. Now start up the projector. There we are. I don't think you knew I was on a roving assignment that day, Sandra. I was using a portable camera with a telephoto lens. Managed to get some very unusual shots. Oh, here's a pan start of the chase. Your brain Take a look is at the mason spinning there. like that projection now, machine. Well shot of you know what's coming next, don't you, Sandra? Frank is gloating now over his telephoto lens. 
The one thing you forgot to figure on. Slowly you ease out of your chair in the dark toward the desk, pull the drawer open, grope for the revolver, find it. Move quietly back to your chair, hiding the gun under your purse on your lap. Of course, Sandy. Every climax has to have a build-up. Telephoto lens is a wonderful thing, isn't it, Sandy? You'd swear you were ten feet from her. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Here comes Janet down the steep pitch. Oh, look ahead of her. In that narrow gap on her left, in the greasewood there. <laughs> Surprised, huh? That woman there, crouching next to the trail. Look what she has in her hand. A rope, isn't it? Now, here's a cutback to Janet galloping down the trail. She's almost opposite the woman now. Look. Look at the girl with the rope. Who does she look like, Sandy, huh? Who is it? Stop it! Stop that machine! Okay. Turn on the light, Frank. Hurry up. Right. There. Is that better? All right, Frank. How much do you want for that film? Why, Sandy. What are you... I so... said how much, Frank. <laughs> well, I didn't know you admired my camera work so much, Sandy. Will you come to the point? Well, of course, you've got to admit this is pretty unusual stuff. <laughs> it comes high. How much? Well, I figure you've probably stashed away a couple of hundred thousand in your time. Successful star, you know. Forty grand a picture. Two hundred thousand dollars? Yeah. yeah. Suppose we say half of it. And you get the negatives. What? What made you do this, Frank? Well, I always was a guy for a fast buck. And there was something else, of course. Janet and I were going to be married when the picture was finished. Let's face it, Sandy, a hundred thousand is cheap. Yes, I... I guess you're right. I, I can't afford to take a chance. There's only one way to make sure... Hey, what are you doing? Stay just right there, Frank. Right where you're standing. Put down that gun, Sandy. You can't get away with murder again. No. Listen, Sandy. I'll destroy the film. I'll... Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. And now, back to the Whistler. It was the only way out, wasn't it, Sandra? It was all there on the film, everything. Absolute ironclad proof. And you were smart enough to realize you could never end it by paying him off. The black, blinding hatred for him closed in as you gripped the gun tight and pulled the trigger once, then twice more, and then... <laughs> Sandy, you poor, stupid little... Frank! I, I shot you, Frank. Why don't you... <laughs> They're all gone now, honey. You better let me have the gun. Get away from me, Frank! Give me that gun. That's it. You're a cold-blooded killer, aren't you, Sandy? But you're at the end of your rope now. What is it? I, I don't understand. The gun was loaded with blanks, darling. All right, gentlemen, you can come in now. Looks like the scene's over. All right, Frank. Come on, Dr. Rogers. Officer? Gordon, what are you... The required number of witnesses, Sandy. Are you satisfied, officer? I don't think there'll be any question. I might as well tell you, Sandy. We faked that film. What? You mean there was no... There was nothing except a healthy suspicion on the part of Dr. Rogers that you murdered Janet Blaisdell. Seems you talked rather freely while you were under the anesthetic some time ago. He insisted we examine the point on the Mesa Trail where Janet fell. All we could find was a hole on the left-hand side of the trail, as if a stake had been driven there. So we made a long guess and shot the scene with a stock actress made up to look like you, just to see what you'd have to say. Isn't that right, Doctor? Yes, of course. There was nothing to go on except what you said under anesthesia while I was working on your face. Interesting, isn't it, Sandra? The one thing in the world you treasured most, the thing you killed for, gave you away. Your million-dollar face.
Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment. Featured in tonight's cast were Mary Lansing and Gerald Moore. This program produced by George W. Allen, based on a story by B. Marsh, music by Wilbur Hatch... This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>